the greatness of God. I thought initially that I might title this talk something like, What is so great about God? The downside from such a title is the undertone of disrespect in it. But the upside would have been to get you motivated right away on the defensive to say, I know what's great about God, and it's this. You're going to hear my perspective on God's greatness. But it's only my perspective. I'm sure you have thought about it and often voiced it countless times in your prayers, your witnessing, and even your testimonies. It's likely you have some different reasons than I do of what makes him exalted in your mind. Yesterday, Brother Ernie challenged us all to strive to have spiritual discussions in our fellowship. So I have a suggestion for you. If you need a starter in one of these discussions, I'd ask you to share those thoughts you have on your perspective of the greatness of our Heavenly Father. Share them with me, share them with each other in your fellowship. You might even start off one of your conversations with something like, you know, Brother Russ really missed the boat when he didn't focus on such and such a point on God's greatness. Before we go on with this consideration, there's one thing we need to make clear, and that's our motivation. I'm sure it's yours as well. We embark on this consideration for the glorification of his name and his character, and not in any way for what it does for us. I'm sure we are all truly repulsed by those who, while proclaiming that God is great, commit act, atrocious acts of violence. In doing this, they essentially are saying God's greatness is enhanced or glorified by those acts. But in reality, nothing is further from the truth. God is only diminished in the eyes of other parties by such acts, being not, in, being not seen in the light of his magnificent character, but by the unenlightened as a motivator of violence. And the perpetrator in such acts is only puffed up with inappropriate feelings of self-worth and pride in the process. In fact, God is great, was great, and will always be great, irrespective of any human life, any human thought, or any uh, any human action. His greatness is manifest not based on what his followers do in his name, but in what they appropriate to their, all, to their own character from the study and imitation of his. And such will be the way we approach the subject this afternoon. We'll take a look at his character, his attributes, and search for the basis as well as the height and breadth of his greatness. In this consideration, we will also be referring to the human race as God's creation, without making the distinction of the Logos role of carrying out the Father's design and will in this act of creation. This is by design due to the fact that we want to be focusing primarily on God's direct relationship to Adam's race, both in the little garden and after the completion of the little season. We open this with a, with a hymn about one aspect of his greatness, that being his faithfulness. But I'm not going to start there. It's a little too soon for that. It fits more appropriately near the end of our remarks. So keep it in mind, but file it away for 30 minutes or so. In looking into the greatness of God, where do we start? We realize that he has four primary attributes that describe him and to some degree his nature. His greatness should be manifest in all of those attributes, so logically that might be a good premise to base the beginning of our, uh, of our consideration on, and we'll do that. Let's begin with God's power. What shows us his great power? Mull those, mull those possibilities over in your mind. What shows the greatness of God's power? There is nothing, in fact, that is greater around us that we know of than the universe itself. And the creation of this natural realm is clearly one of the grandest manifestations of his power that we can observe on this side of the veil. 
One of Sister Camille and I's favorite scriptures is Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There are endless magnificent pictures of portions of the universe that he created for this realm. Billions of solar systems within our own Milky Way galaxy. How can we even consider the extent of his creation? We can contemplate it, though. We have a handle on some perspectives of that creation. We have a handle on the size of our own planet. Many of you have gotten on airliners and traveled a quarter of the Earth's circumference in going to Europe or, or the Far East, five or 6,000 miles at a time. We can at least comprehend the magnitude of that distance. We can get our hands around it. We can touch it. But now take that next step, that first hop off the planet to the nearest thing we can land on, and that's the moon. It's about a quarter of a million miles away, the equivalent of 10 full trips around the Earth. The distance to our closest neighbor is so great that communication at the speed of light itself needs around two seconds to transverse the distance. We are already getting to the limits of what we can truly grasp. If we moved out where in the sol outward in the solar system, we find the next celestial body is Mars. The distance to it varies from 48 to 235 million miles because the planets are orbiting the sun at different distances and they get closer and farther apart. The distance to our sun is a relatively constant 93 million miles. Sunlight traveling at 186,000 miles a second takes more than 12 minutes to reach us. We haven't even scratched the surface of the immense distances in the size of the galaxy, much less even our own solar system. The solar system itself is around three and a half to four billion miles in diameter. Nine zeros in that number. And even with that, we still haven't embraced more than a drop in the ocean of God's immense universe. Our galaxy is roughly 90,000 light years in diameter. Now all of a sudden we've jumped from miles to light years. And the universe diameter is estimated to be about 93 billion light years. Light travels six trillion miles in a year. These numbers are so immense, we really don't comprehend how big they truly are. But if you want the diameter of the universe in miles, it's five with 19 zeros after it. There isn't even a way to pronounce that number any other way. The universe may contain as many as 125 billion galaxies. The picture you see right now is a picture ca called Hubble's Ultra Deep Field. It is what is seen when the Hubble, Hubble telescope was trained at the darkest portion of the sky and light was gathered over a period of days for many hours of exposure. And you still see countless galaxies even at what is almost the fringe of our universe. The universe is likely bigger than those current estimates I gave you but because the, the expansion of the universe and the speed of light limits our view of what we can see. The numbers are so big that they're incomprehensible. But with all this grandeur of the universe, the construction of it is the ultimate in simplicity. God designed a small elementary object called an atom and merely binds them in different combinations and quantities and gets all those different elements. You, re you remember on your high school chemistry periodic chart of, of the elements. And yet there's only three simple components to an atom, a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And yet we're able, it yields all that diversity. Well, how do you get all these little objects together and bind them and make all these various elements? God, again, devises a rather simple set of forces, only four, governing those little things as atoms to the largest galaxies. They're all bound together by those forces. We thus have things so incredibly large, made from particles so incredibly small, the grandeur made from this simplicity is just awesome. 
The raw magnitude of his creation is certainly a staggering display of his power. But additionally, remember that in addition to all the energy represented by all those bodies in motion, there's energy as well as that matter in the universe. All those suns producing untold heat. Consider the, the energy just represented by all the matter in the universe. Remember that equation, E equals mc squared? That little c squared term is a three followed by 18 zeros, if you're using metric. Take all that matter in the universe, multiply it by that number, that three with 18 zeros after it, and you've kind of got the physical amount of energy represented in the universe. It's mind-boggling. It's incredible. We can't even understand it. It's just too large. Deuteronomy 10.14, Behold, to the Lord your God belong the heaven and the highest heavens and the earth and all that is in it. In addition to the incredible universe he has created, there is the spiritual realm. We know a lot less about it than we know about the natural realm, but we know that it is superior in every way. I wouldn't have the slightest idea into how to quantify the grandeur, the greatness, and the expanse of the spiritual realm. Clearly, we'll have to wait for that until, the other, until we attain existence on the other side of the veil. But by any measure, any physical measure, God is great. But we're not going to stop with just the physical grandeur of his kingdom. Isaiah 44, 6 Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and there is no God beside me. Job 37, 22. Out of the north comes golden splendor. Around God is awesome majesty. Let's consider now how his wisdom makes him great. Some would want to consider the facts that this universe functions the way it does and there are consistent laws that make, it, make the inanimate physically predictable. That shows wisdom beyond any intellect. Webster defines intelligence as the accumulated or philosophic or scientific learning, <coughs> i.e. knowledge. The ability to discern inner qualities and relationships. That's insight. Good sense, judgment. That may be adequate for some, but it seems a little thin in referring to the grandeur of the wisdom of the Heavenly Father. One aspect of wisdom is the ability to make anything understandable. Someone that can do that is truly wise. Isaiah 118, our Father does that. He says, come now, let us reason together. The thoughts and designs that I have are within your comprehension. An amazing concept. You may not comprehend all the intricacies of creation, all the allegories, symbols, and types, and shadows, and pictures we even find in the truth. Our ability to reason on the prophetic language of Revelation may not be as sharp as some of the brethren. But he makes you wise enough to understand his plans for mankind and for the church and for the nation of Israel and the ultimate destination of those classes. I will give thanks unto thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, and my soul knows it very well. And the heavens declare his righteousness, for God himself is a judge. God sometimes has to delay our understanding so that or it's, it's understanding, especially that he gives to the world of mankind, so that age-ending events happen at the end of the age. He can and often does take advantage of the fact that the truth is often counterintuitive. I wonder what I mean by that. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. As much as we seek to have common sense, often the deeper things of God, his wisdom has made the non-intuitive the truth of the matter. Here's a quick example. You can't really understand the motion of the stars and the planets or space travel unless you understand gravity, the fact that it even exists. 
Well, for the first 5,800 years of man existence, they looked at the fact that when I stop supporting an object, it falls. That's its natural behavior and runs across the floor as well. <laughs> when I, that was considered the natural order of things. If you don't support something, it falls. That's just the way it is. So you don't need to look for a force causing that. And mankind didn't for a long time. That was just considered the natural behavior. It wasn't until a God-respecting scientist and mathematician by the name of Isaac Newton came along and stated the non-intuitive premise. Objects at rest stayed at rest unless not acted upon by a force. And in this case, that force was gravity. The non this non-intuitive conclusion cleared the way for a great percentage of the increase of knowledge that we have experienced since then. In this case, God hid the truth in everyone's plain sight. Gravity affects everyone's life from the day they are born till the day they die. And yet for most of his existence, man could not even perceive its existence. Now that is great. Makes you kind of wonder what else God may be hiding from us in plain sight. Psalm 104, 24. O oh Lord, how many are thy works! In wisdom thou hast made them all, and the earth is full of thy possessions. Psalm 86, 8. There is no, no one like thee among the gods, O oh Lord, nor are there any works like thine. How great is his love? The fact that there even is a human race is the first evidence of this. Think of anyone with great resources. What we perceive of the natural tendency is to hoard those things, to not share them. Now consider what God provided us when he decided he was going to provide this natural realm that we live in and create independent beings that we are with free moral agency within it. He could have limited the natural realm to a galaxy or a solar system, and said he created the most magnificent universe for mankind not to just experience, but to dwell in forever. Only a great love would do that. But merely creating a magnificent environment for your creation was not enough for God. A loving father wanted the best for his creation. He wants the ultimate for it. Not to live for just a few years, but to live forever, and not to live in a world corrupted by sin, greed, and evil, but in a perfect world, when an entire human race could exist for the benefit of their fellow man and the continual praise of the Father. <coughs> Mankind is truly the child of the Creator and his master craftsman, his only begotten Son, Jesus. And when we think of the relationship in that context, we can begin to appreciate the Father's love for mankind, for yes, we are his children as well. But the provision of the means of man's attainment of life everlasting is the real full measure of the incredible depth of the Father's love, providing one's only begotten Son as a price. But the greatness of God's love is shown most clearly in how he provided those means. And that's almost universally related to that one word, Jesus. John comments on the love of God in the fourth chapter of 1 John, verses 9 and 10. By, this love, by the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Not only was it difficult for natural man to perceive the love of God in general before the first advent, it was difficult for the house of servants, natural Israel, to perceive the love of God. 
The nation had been in and out of captivity, blessed with good kings, and suffered under evil ones. They had seen the promise of the Messiah go unfulfilled for 4,000 years. They were asking, if God is so great, where is the love of God? As John tells us, it was manifested by the provision of Jesus. It had been there all along, and it was hid some, to some degree in the prophecies of the Old Testament. To a great degree, there had never been before this a significant manifestation of God's love before Jesus' sacrifice. We told you about the creation of mankind in general, but man didn't perceive that at that time. Brother Russell says on page 564 of the question book that although the angels witnessed some manifestations of God's justice and mercy up until the first advent, even they, the angels, had not witnessed such a significant act of love by God on behalf of the world. Even this supreme act of love is seen only by a relatively small proportion of mankind, those who have an appreciation for the sacrifice of our Lord. The appreciation of this manifestation of God's love will go unappreciated by the vast majority of the race of, of Adam until the mediatorial phase of the kingdom. In verse 10, John points out that, our lo that the love of God um, is not really the point. God provided his son for, the, for our redemption, not when we were worthy of covenanting with him, but when we were sinners. We were unjustified, unappreciative of that magnitude of that gift. You know, continuing along the line of God's love, let us look at Romans, the fifth chapter, and pick up Paul's thoughts on the subject. We'll read verses 5 through 10. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given unto us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Let's skip down to verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we sh shall be saved by his life. In verse 5, Paul brings out the importance of spirit begettal in the recognition of the love of God. This is consistent with our previous con considerations. If we have not fully comprehended what Christ's sacrifice does for us, we are unable to rightly appreciate the love of God in providing it. In verse 6, Paul emphasizes the love encompassed by the provision of, of the perfect man for a race of sinners. While they were sinners in a wholly unappreciative condition. In light of this, he goes on into verse 8 to further reiterate that God, in essence, did just that. While no humans were in a position to even realize the great sacrifice that God provided in our Lord, the gift of love was given unconditionally. It was a gift motivated by grace and love. And it goes even further. The love of God is not content with merely of the provision of the Savior and the arrangement that if anybody shall hear him and believe, he shall be blessed. But this love of God proposes to go beyond that, namely that he who thus redeems the race shall become king of the earth. His scepter, his rule shall be from sea to sea, from river to river to the ends of the earth. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God and the knowledge of the Lord shall fill the whole earth or shall fill the whole earth as the waters cover the grief. His love is why God is so great. Psalm 89, 14. Let's move into the, the area of God's justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of thy throne. Loving kindness and truth go before thee. There are so many scriptures of expounding and glorifying God for justice. 
that we likely could go right through the rest of our time just reading scriptures without taking a time for comment, any time for comment. Whether before a civil court or maybe under review by your temporal boss or for your eternal existence, all mankind really would desire in those situations is true justice. And with our Father, we have no doubt to any of us and all of us and all of mankind receiving it. Deuteronomy 3, uh, 32 and 4. The rock, his worth, work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright, righteous and upright is he. God's justice is not done in a vacuum. It is always done in the context of love and mercy and the desire for the ultimate benefit of the one being judged. Just think about it. The creator of the universe, concerned with the well-being and ultimate eternal destiny of each lowly human being. We had this shown so beautifully by our brother Homer this morning as he discussed the theme text of 1 Timothy 2.4, who will have all men to be saved and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. I could take so many of those thoughts and put them in right here, and you can just do that parenthetically and just remember Brother Homer's discourse and see how that, the provision of these, these are, this is almost a parenthetical remark by Paul, who will have all men to be saved and to come, and come to a knowledge of the truth. And yet it speaks so much about the greatness of our Father. We recognize that the very reason for the permission of evil was not to condemn man, but to provide an experience with sin so that mankind can judge the, for themselves the exceeding sinfulness of it and to be able to intelligently choose righteousness over any sinful temptation. And by providing the Redeemer, man eternally benefits from experiencing sin, even though it is a tough experience. But it's a just method that prevents him, mankind, from suffering an eternal condemnation from a single act. Psalm 33, 4, For the word of the Lord is upright, and his work is done in faithfulness. You know, man has a saying that absolute power corrupts, absolutely. But with Jehovah, we have no such concerns. He obviously is the absolute power. We know we can count on him not only for dealing justly with all, not only in the present, but always. Job 37, 23. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He is exalted in power, and he will not do violence to justice and abundant righteousness. Again, we could go on for a long time on God's justice, but truly the fact of his provisions for the, in the plan and also the way he treats the world of mankind and the church in terms of justice makes him truly great. Another aspect of God's greatness, let's look at Malachi 3.6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. <coughs> It was even in the, in the verse of the hymn we just sung. He changes not. His compassion, it fails not. God's greatness is also manifested in his ability to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Psalm 92, 5. How great are thy works, O Lord! Thy thoughts are very deep. He, provide man, he provides man descriptions of some of the universe's secrets, some of its concepts, not even due to be understand until years in the future. <coughs> he provides those, and yet he, he gets, gets a thought across that's true then and will be true when the ultimate truth is, is found out. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even unto the end. He gives us these descriptions of creation that are timeless, even giving the countless marching on of time. They are true irregardless of man's ever-increasing knowledge of the universe. 
Look at Job 26, 7. Job said, he stretches out over the north over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. Well, that was a perfect explanation on how the earth is placed in the heavens for man to ponder until those laws of motion that came along 5,800 years later explained them in terms of gravity. And they're still true today. The earth seemingly hangs on nothing. It hangs on invisible forces. And note, it's perfectly, this is perfectly true both then and now. And although at most early times man was positive of the flatness of the earth, God told Job he knew it was round and spherical. Look at Job 26.10. He inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of the light and the darkness. Now you may not, you may say, well, it's got circle in it, but it doesn't really tell you the earth is a sphere. Mm -hmm. The only object on which you can project light and the boundary between light and shadow forms a circle is a sphere. So a simple pondering of the geometry that man knew about would have told him that this scripture was telling him that the earth was a sphere because that circle was inscribed upon it between light and darkness. How incredibly timeless is this reference? There's more to God's greatness. And this may be the focal point of what makes, really makes God great. We would submit for your consideration that the thing that really makes God the great God that he is is the undeniable fact that he constrains himself. You know, we left justice as one of the last attributes because the concept of self-constraint is closely aligned with it. Now let us consider first how God does constrain himself before trying to relate it to his greatness. In considering those four attributes, we recognize that two of them, wisdom and power, are just qualities that he possesses. But love and justice are attributes that require action to manifest. Love and justice can be used as descriptors of how and why God takes certain actions. But for those two, we have to say that when God acts, he acts in accordance with the principles of love and justice. We can even say that his actions are constrained by the principles of love and justice. Now we are faced with a kind of chicken and egg problem. Is it really that God can only act the way he does because love and justice are inseparable parts of his being? Or is it more proper and more accurate to say that he could act any way he desires? He is the most powerful being in the universe. But he doesn't act in any way he desires because he chooses to constrain himself by these righteous principles. We think this latter is the more proper thought. God is the first and the last, the almighty, the most powerful and omnipotent being in the universe. And we realize that that difference between these two perspectives may seem subtle in that man sees no difference in God either way. All he sees is the, the righteous father. But to say that the most powerful being in the universe cannot do anything is not a logical deduction of the facts. He has the ability to act in any way, do anything at any time he pleases. Now I'm gonna stop, pause here. Don't infer anything I've not said. For instance, to say that God could lie and we'll expand on that a little bit, does not mean that there is some inner part, some inner desire on his part to do so, or that he is warring against it and constant in battle, in battle with it, like the new creature is against the old tendencies. What it does mean is that the heavenly and the natural realm, in those natural realms, and even in the heavenly realm, there are absolutes. There are good and evil. There is right and wrong, love and hate. And God has established at some time in the distant past, and again, we can't describe this, we don't really understand it, but sometime in the distant past, he decided that he will always act in accordance with the principles associated with righteousness. Even though it may, be, may make some of you uncomfortable to think of, God has the capability of, to do anything or engage in any activity, right or wrong, but he won't. 
He has, never has had any desire to do so. He voluntarily, though, constrains himself to the attributes and the principles we have been discussing. No one or nothing else is capable of constraining God other than himself. And isn't that the ultimate in his greatness? When one can do anything and decides to do only what is right. Now, I'm sure most of you are already thinking about Titus 1 and 2. I, I'm sorry, Titus 1, 1 and 2. Paul, a bondservant of the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of, the cho of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago. Does this really mean that God cannot lie? Does this mean he lacks any ability to engage in any, in any of the like behavior? No, it doesn't. Let's look at the two words. They're a single uh, Greek word. They're translated cannot lie. These words come from Greek uh, Strong's 893. And instead of saying that God can't lie, Weymouth translates it different. He says, in the hope which God who is never false to his word. Now, you may be thinking, that's okay, that's, what, what's the real difference? If God is just as capable of non-righteous behavior, but never has or will engage in it, what's the real difference? We think this is the real magnificence of our creator. You know, I, we can't take time to go into it, but other cre uh, kings and dictators for ages past have done have taken the stances, do as I say, not as I do. I'm in charge. I can do anything I want. God could have had it. Of course, he doesn't. But the fact that he can, the most powerful being in the universe, constrains himself to these righteous principles is truly great. You know, although it seemed like God may have demanded too much of his creation because he literally demands the same of us. He demands that we constrain our behavior and our, uh, our thoughts to his principles. It may seem like he, that is demanding too much, requiring this and the actual perfection for a condition of life. But think of it, if he, he requires no more of the human race constraining themselves to righteousness and goodness and principles of love and justice than he de demands of himself. Exalted as he is, he requires creation to do exactly what he himself does. Psalm 147.5 Great is our Lord and abundant in strength. His understanding is infinite. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. Yes, our God, Yahweh, Jehovah, that is truly great beyond this or any human attempt to quantify it. He takes the smallest and builds the grandest objects in the universe. He takes the weakest force and compounds them into the strongest. He provides love for the human race, and when they forfeit it, he provides his only begotten son as a redeemer, for, as an offering for sin so that they may attain everlasting life. His character, faithfulness, and consistency are beyond reproach. And when defining what is required of cre his creation, he requires the same basic constraints he assigns to himself. In conclusion, Deuteronomy 4.39. Know therefore today and take it to your heart that the Lord he is God in heaven, above, and on earth below, and there is no other. This greatness is only appreciated now by a handful of his creation. But how we all long for the day when not only the household of faith, but the entire human creation joyfully praises, praises God and gives him the accolades, accolades that are his due and says, my God, how great.